All right, so Jesus is the new Adam, Mary's the new Eve. What about the Ark of the Covenant? Well, you look at the New Testament, it very clearly depicts Jesus as the new manna from heaven. That's John chapter 6. I deal with that in my book, Jesus and the Jewish Roots of the Eucharist, right? Uh, Jesus describes himself as the bread that has come down from heaven. Now, if you're a first century Jew and you know that about Christ, then the question that follows is, well, if Jesus is the new manna, then where is the new ark? Because every Jew would have known that when the manna came down, they put it in a golden jar and then they put it in the Ark of the Covenant. Right? So, in order to see how Mary fulfills that uh, prophecy of the new Ark, we've got to go back to the Old Testament and look at the Ark of the Covenant there. Now, when it comes to the Ark, it's helpful that there was a movie about the Ark, <laughs> Raiders of the Lost Ark. So, if, even if you haven't read the book, you've seen the movie. Oh, that joke's getting too old. Okay, I won't do it again. All right. <laughs> Uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Now, actually, this one's really important for me because when I was a kid, uh, I was too young to see Raiders of the Lost Ark when it came out in the theater. But I did get a read-along record book. I don't know if the little records that would come along. And they had all these pictures of Professor Indiana Jones and the Bible. And I remember this one picture from the record book, which I still own, uh, of Indiana Jones pointing out a picture of uh, the Old Testament. And it's an image of the Israelites carrying the Ark of the Covenant into battle. Because whenever they brought the ark into battle, they would defeat their enemies. They were unstoppable. And whenever they didn't bring it, they would be defeated. And of course, in the movie, that's why the Nazis want the ark. Because it's so powerful, right? Um, I can't help but wonder if that had any influence on me becoming a Bible professor. You know, Because like, Indiana Jones is a professor. I'm just throwing that out there, okay? <laughs> He's a professor. <clears throat> All right. Anyway, uh, so... In the, Ark, in the Old Testament, the Ark of the Covenant is this powerful object, and it's powerful because it is the dwelling place of God on earth. The Lord comes down, dwells in the Ark with His people, and then moves with them throughout the desert in the book of Exodus. So when you look at Exodus 25 to 40, you're going to see some elements of the Ark of the Covenant that are really important for understanding Mary's identity in the New Testament. Here are a, a few of them. First, I've already mentioned, it's the dwelling place of God on earth. Second, it's a sacred container, okay? So it was, a, it was a box made of acacia wood that was covered in gold uh, with two golden statues of angels on top of it. And the Israelites put certain things in it. They put three things in particular. First, the manna from heaven, already mentioned that. Second, they put the two tablets of the Ten Commandments in the ark. And then third, they put the staff of Aaron that miraculously budded to show his tribe was the priest priestly tribe chosen by God, they put the staff of Aaron in the ark, and they carried it uh, about with those three sacred objects. And most people know that, but there's some other elements that are a little interesting that are easy to miss. Uh, number three, the ark was also described as holy and as having been made of incorruptible wood. Really interesting. Uh, it was made of this special wood, I already mentioned it's called acacia wood, which is very hard very durable, and just does not rot, okay? And so when you wanted to make something sacred, you would use acacia wood because it was really hard and it didn't corrupt, okay? You don't use, like, cheap pine, okay? It just rots, like that fence I made a few years back. Paid big money for it, two years, rotten. Okay, I need an acacia wood fence. That would only cost, like, 100K. All right. Okay. No, incorruptible wood. Fourth, um, the ark is covered in gold. Why is it covered in gold? Right? Why don't they just give the gold to the poor Israelites? You know, people complain, why do you have all these gold in your churches? Because that's how God likes it, evidently, right? <laughs> he commands them to cover the ark with gold because gold is a symbol of divinity. And it's a sign that in the ark, God is with us on earth. We're like entering into heaven on earth. Whenever you see gold, it's a symbol of heaven on earth. It's a symbol of purity. It's a symbol of holiness, the absolute holiness of the ark, which if you look in the book of Kings, was so holy that if any mere man would touch it, right, he could be struck dead. Holiness is, it's good, but it's dangerous. It's like Aslan in the Chronicles of Narnia. No, it's true, right? He's a good lion, but he's not tame. And that's how God is in the Old Testament. He's good, but he's dangerous. He's not tame. He's powerful. He's mysterious. One other element of the ark that's really interesting uh, that I just discovered in, in working on this book 
is that whenever they took the ark out, it wasn't just gold. They would cover it in a cloth, and the cloth was blue. So if you think Ark of the Covenant, you think blue and gold. Isn't that interesting? I went to the University of Notre Dame. What were, what, what were the colors? Blue and gold. All right, so Numbers chapter 4, verse 7, the Ark is blue and gold. Uh, and then finally, this is most importantly, uh, the reason the Ark was the dwelling place of God is because when they completed it, God comes down from heaven in the book of Exodus in chapter 40, and his glory cloud, the Shekinah of his glory, the pillar of fire and pillar of cloud, comes down upon the ark so that the Lord might dwell there. Uh, Exodus 40, verse 17 and 18 actually says this. I've given you a quote. Moses brought the ark into the tabernacle, and then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. That's why the ark's special, because God dwells in the ark with his people. And so after this happens, what do they do? They head on over to the promised land. They cross the River Jordan. They bring the ark. The ark is the first thing to go across the River Jordan with 12 priests. They carry it across the waters part, bring the ark into the promised land. And then it moves around for a bit during the period of Joshua and the judges until David takes the ark of the covenant and brings it up to Jerusalem so that he can give a permanent sanctuary, a permanent place of worship for God's people to encounter him eventually in the temple of Solomon. And 2 Kings chapter, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 6 and 1 Kings chapter 8. All right. So that's about a thousand years before Christ. Unfortunately, though, if you fast forward to the 6th century BC, something devastating happens to the people of Israel and to the Ark of the Covenant. The Babylonians come in to the land of Israel. They conquer the Judeans. They conquer the Southerners. They burn the city of Jerusalem to the ground. They destroy the temple. And in the process of all that, what happens? The ark is lost, right? Now, um, and in fact, Josephus tells us this. He was a first century Jewish historian. By the time Jesus was alive in the first century AD, everybody knew that if you went into the Holy of Holies, Guess what was in it? Nothing. No, no, nothing. nothing. It's empty. It's just a pitch black room. Right? The priest was supposed to go in the Holy Holies once a year and pour the blood of atonement on the ark, on the mercy seat to cover the ark. But they can't do that when Jesus is alive because there is no ark. It's gone. Right? Now, of course, this led to all kinds of theories about what happened to the ark. This is why the, the title of the movie was Raiders of the lost ark, right? Because it's lost, right? And so you have all kinds of speculation about what happened to the ark. You know, some people think that the Babylonians took it, although the book of Kings does not list it among the implements that they took from Jerusalem when they destroyed it. Um, other people suggest, ah, oh, that it's been found and that it's in this monastery in Ethiopia. You've, you, you watch these documentaries. I know you've seen this stuff on Discovery Channel and History Channel, right? And they make you sit through two hours of where is the ark, and then you get to the end, they're like, oh, it's it's in a sanctuary that's protected by these monks and we can't get in, sorry. Right? <laughs> so you're like, okay, man, why did I just waste all this time? Uh, no one can verify or falsify if it's the ark. And then there are all kinds of other theories as well. What's interesting about this is, as Catholics, we don't need to actually wonder. We actually know what happened to the ark because our Bible tells us. Right? In the Catholic Old Testament, in the second book of Maccabees, we have the most ancient account of what happened to the Ark of the Covenant in 2 Maccabees chapter 2. Now, most Protestant Christians aren't familiar with this ancient tradition because it's only in the Catholic Old Testament. And most Catholics aren't familiar with this ancient Jewish tradition because it's in the Catholic Old Testament, right? <laughs> so nobody knows about it. But it's very important, okay? So in 2 Maccabees chapter 2, it tells us this. It tells us that Jeremiah the prophet, who was alive during the destruction of the temple, took the ark, he was a priest, and he hid it in Mount Nebo, which is east of the Jordan River, where Moses went up and saw the promised land before he died. Not Mount Sinai, Mount Nebo. Okay, so this is what it says. Quote, Jeremiah ordered that the tent and the ark should follow with him, and he went out to the mountain where Moses had gone up and seen the inheritance of God. 
And Jeremiah came and he found a cave and he brought there the ark and he sealed up the entrance. Now some of those who followed him came up to mark the way, but they could not find it. Now when Jeremiah learned of it, he declared, the place, meaning the location of the ark, shall remain unknown until the glory of the Lord and the cloud appear. 2 Maccabees chapter 2, verse 4 to 8. What does that mean, the cloud? He's not talking about a, a thunderstorm here. He's talking about the glory cloud from the Old Testament. Because in the book of Ezekiel, it tells us that before the temple was destroyed, the glory cloud departed from the ark and departed from the temple, and they heard a voice, we, are, we shall depart hence. Like In other words, we're leaving. Okay, Meaning that the angelic presence that was there with the ark and the divine presence took off. And then the temple was destroyed. So what Jeremiah is saying is, you're not going to know where the ark is until the cloud that overshadowed the ark comes back down again from heaven. All right, now with all that in mind, now that you got your Jewish CCD, right, and your catechism, all got it down, now go to the New Testament and read the account of the Annunciation to Mary. And you're going to see something very, very important. And it's this, that in the Gospel of Luke, Mary is depicted as fulfilling the role of the Ark of the Covenant in the New Testament. She is the Ark, so to speak, of the New Covenant. And you can see this whenever the angel says to her, and this is in Luke chapter 1, verse 35, the angel Gabriel comes to her and says, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Luke chapter 1, verse 35. Now, um, if you look at that little chart that I've given you there, Luke uses a very distinctive Greek verb to describe the Holy Spirit and the power of God overshadowing Mary. The Greek word there is episkiazo. It's just used a couple times in the Old Testament, and it's used with reference to the glory cloud overshadowing the ark. So in Exodus 40, verse 35, the glory cloud, episkiat, saying it overshadows the tabernacle with the ark in it. And the same thing happens in Luke chapter 1, verse 35. The Holy Spirit, episkiat, say, overshadows the Virgin Mary. And even Protestant commentators on Luke, who know the Old Testament well, and who looked at this, it said, it appears here that Mary is being depicted as the new Ark of the Covenant. In other words, her body is the new dwelling place of God on earth. Now, it doesn't stop there. If I had more time, I could actually show you how uh, it isn't just the Annunciation, it's also the visitation to Elizabeth. So in the book, uh, Jewish Roots of Mary on page 58, I take you through more parallels. This is just one. There are about five parallels between Mary and the Ark in the Old Testament and New Testament in the visitation to Mary. Um, so in the Old Testament, uh, 2 Samuel 6, David arose and went to the hill country of Judah, just like Mary arose and went to the hill country of Elizabeth, when living in Judah. And David says in 2 Samuel 6, how can the Ark of the Lord come to me? And in the New Testament, Elizabeth says, how is it that the mother of my Lord should come to me, right? Uh, in the Old Testament, David leaps before the ark, and he shouts with a loud voice. And although we missed this, in Luke chapter 1, it says that not only does John the Baptist leap in Elizabeth's womb, but Elizabeth cries out with a loud shout, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. She doesn't just quietly say it. She shouts it. She exclaims it. She's filled with the Holy Spirit. And then finally, the ark remains in the house of Obed-Edom for three months. And then Luke says something weird. He doesn't say Mary stayed with Elizabeth till John was born. He says Mary stayed in the house of Elizabeth for three months. Now, hmm, why does he do that? Well, again, Catholic and non-Catholic scholars have recognized it's because he's drawing out the parallels between the ark coming up to Jerusalem and Mary coming up to the house of Elizabeth because she is the new ark of the covenant. Now, if you have any doubts about that, you can just fast forward to the book of Revelation, and there's one more connection between Mary and the ark. It's in uh, Revelation 12, again, the image of the woman clothed with the sun, but it's in the immediate preceding verse uh, in Revelation 11:19. 19. 
Uh, most of us miss this because the chapter is divided, but there aren't any chapter divisions in the original Greek. In fact, there aren't even, even periods and sentence divisions. It's just letters running in a line, right? So in the original vision, scholars recognize there's a parallel being drawn here. Look what it says. Revelation 11:19. 19. John says, Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of His covenant was seen within His temple. Now pause right there. If you're a first century Jew, you've been waiting for the ark to show up right, for almost six centuries, right, since the time of Jeremiah. Everybody's waiting. When is the ark going to come back? Where is it going to be? So when John has this vision, this is a big deal. And far from being in Mount Nebo across the Jordan, where is the ark? It is in heaven. And no sooner does the, does the temple in heaven open, because the ark's in the Holy of Holies, right? The doors open, John sees into it. Then he also sees another sign in heaven. What? A woman clothed with the sun. And the two verbs that John used here parallel one another. And scholars have pointed out that he appears to be describing, and he does this elsewhere in the book, like overlapping symbols. Two ways of looking at the same thing. The ark and the woman, right? The place where God dwells. Mary, the mother of the Messiah. All right, so. So what? So Mary's the new ark. Big deal. She's just an ordinary woman, right? Well, not really. Yeah, there's a little more to it than that, right? What are the implications of Mary being the new ark? Well, first of all, it should just tell us about the holiness of Mary. Sometimes people get bothered because we call her Holy Mary, Mother of God. Well, she's the new Ark of the Covenant. I'm sorry. She's holy, <laughs> like by definition. Okay, her body is consecrated. It's set apart to be the dwelling place of God. Now, I don't have time to get into this tonight. Uh, I have a whole chapter in the book on the perpetual virginity of Mary. All right? This is something that not just Protestant Christians, but lots of Catholics I've met, really struggle with the Catholic doctrine that Mary remained a virgin her entire life, that she didn't have any other children, and that her and St. Joseph never had marital relations. And people will ask, you know, what, what's the big deal? I mean, if they were married, why would she remain a virgin within marriage? You know, isn't that a, that's a good, is there something wrong with sex? I mean, doesn't God say, be fruitful and multiply? It's the first words out of his mouth in Genesis. So obviously, marital relations are, are good, there's nothing wrong with them, so why does Mary remain a virgin? I have a whole chapter that deals with that and the brothers of Jesus and all that stuff. But for now, I just want to throw out one little point. If St. Joseph even had the slightest clue that the, the Holy Spirit in the Incarnation overshadowed Mary, like the glory cloud overshadowed the ark, then he also would have had a very lively awareness of the sanctity and the holiness of Mary as well. Right? Remember, in the Old Testament, if you're not a consecrated priest, you can't even touch the ark, right? Because it's so powerful, it's so holy, it's set apart for God. Anyway, we can maybe talk about that in a question and answer session if you want a little bit more, but I just want you to think about that. So the holiness of Mary. Second, it's her body that's holy because her body is the dwelling place of God. So in the Old Testament, what was in the ark? It was the Ten Commandments, it was the manna, it was a cell phone, and uh, <laughs> no. That was not in the Old Testament, right? And they won't be in heaven either, right? No cell phones. Good reason to try to get to heaven. No cell phones, all right? Okay, where was I? What was in the ark? Thank you. Okay, so what's in the ark? Ten Commandments, the manna from heaven, and then the staff of Aaron. So if Mary's the new ark, what is it that's in her body? The Word made flesh the bread of life, and the eternal priest of God, the true priest, Jesus Christ. That's who she is. That's the role she plays. And then finally, Mary's identity as the new ark is crucial for understanding her bodily assumption into heaven. Because if Jesus is the new Moses, who's inaugurated a new exodus, and who brings us into the heavenly promised land, right, the heavenly temple, like Hebrews says, then where does the new ark belong? Where does it go? It goes in the heavenly holy of holies. 
And not just Mary's soul, because it wasn't Mary's soul that's the ark. It's her what? It's her body. So it's fitting that if she's the ark, that at the end of her life, her body would be taken up into the heavenly temple to be with God. And Pope Benedict XVI actually said this in his homily on the Assumption of Mary. August 15, 2011, you don't have to listen to me, the Holy Father said, quote, if Mary is the new ark, then it makes sense that her body would not experience corruption, but would be brought up into the heavenly holy of holy. Remember, the ark was made of incorruptible wood, and so was the body of Our Lady.